Jesus is risen and he is risen with you and with me. Hello, welcome to today's worship stream. I'm Gabriel, lead pastor of Grace Communion Richardson, a diverse group that seek to know Jesus and to make him known through worship, through family fellowship, and through neighborhood engagement, all out of the sacrificial and compelling love of God shared with us in Jesus Christ and by the power of his spirit. You are welcome to today's worship stream. We welcome your comments and your prayers. Uh, if you have any, please don't hesitate to send them. You can see on the screen the address that you can send your prayer requests and your comments to. And I promise you we will follow up with your prayer request. We had, at least I did, and I know a number of us did too, an inspiring and joyful and meaningful Easter Sunday online and in person. And I just want to say thank you to our Hope Avenue champion, Richard, to my lovely and talented wife, Christine, to you and everyone who prayed and worked hard to make the Easter celebrations not only possible, not only successful, but an inspiring and joyous time for all of us. I was particularly inspired by the testimonies of God's grace and God's goodness, God's blessings, even during these times of COVID, as a number of you shared. And of course, all the thanks and glory to God, Father, Son, and Spirit for their grace and for the blessings that we have. So what next? After Resurrection Sunday, what next? Well, that is the question that today's message is about. What Jesus himself says is next for you and for me. He says he's sending us out as his messengers with the good news of God's sacrificial love for you, for me, for all of humanity, and our risen life in Jesus. He says, go out with this gospel, this good news. And we're going to talk some more about that in the message today. And we're also looking forward to, as, as a what next, the day that the church was born, so to speak, that the church was commissioned, Pentecost Sunday. Of course, if Easter is a fulcrum of our Christian life and activity, then Pentecost Sunday is a lightning rod of our actions. So we look forward to that as well. Now, speaking primarily to Grace Communion Richardson members, and our supporters, I just want to say thank you for your continued generous financial support and your prayers. They are very much appreciated and welcome. And for those of you out there who feel moved to join in financially supporting our gospel work, you can see on the screen uh, some of the ways that you can do so. Uh, financial donations are tax deductible and they are very much appreciate it. God bless you. Now, if you don't mind joining our praise team for a song, and then after that, I'll come back for today's message. Please stay with us. Thank you. 
pray. Eternal God, Father, Son, and Spirit, thank you for reminding us during this Easter season of your incredible, amazing, sacrificial love for us uh, that is abundantly expressed in Jesus Christ and through your Spirit. Thank you for the reality and the truth uh, that death sin and the law uh, do not have ultimate power over us any longer. Death does not have the final word. Jesus does. Thank you for reminding us uh, that in Christ we have life and we have eternal life of relationship with you and with each other. And thank you for the truth that he's risen with us. And he sends us out to participate in him in sharing this good news with others. Help us, Lord, to yield to that and help us to go and to go with Jesus. In his name, I pray. Amen. So, Resurrection Sunday is come and gone. What next? That's a good question for all of us to ask. What does it mean for us going forward? The risen Lord raises you up and sends you out in participation with him in his father's business. And the father's business is bringing many sons and daughters into glory. The father's business is making many disciples who make disciples. The Father's business is expanding the kingdom of His Son. The Father's business is engaging in a timeless relationship of love with you and with all of humanity. So Jesus bids you come and go. Go to others with this message, the good news, that's the gospel of the sacrificial love of God for all and the invitation to all into an eternal love relationship, joy relationship with his son. Go, Jesus says, I am sending you out to share your experience of this and your risen life in me and with me with others. Jesus says, that's what's next. Are you willing? Are you going? Well, let's look at what Jesus says in John chapter 20. Last Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, we read the story of Jesus' resurrection and we ended in John chapter 20 and in verse 19 and I want to start from there today. In verse 19 of John the 20th chapter where well, verse 18 we realize that Jesus revealed himself to Mary Magdalene 
Jesus revealed the risen Lord appeared first to a woman, and it was to Mary Magdalene. In verse 18, the 20th chapter of John. And in verse 19, that same day, that Sunday, he appeared to the disciples as they were in a locked room, afraid. And Jesus came and stood in the midst of them. Verse 19, let's pick it up from there. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. So let's pause here for a minute. If you can imagine the setting, the scenario here. Jesus has been arrested, he's been abused, he's been mocked, he's been beaten, his flesh has been torn, he's been crucified, and he died on the cross. Uh, the woman, the three Marys, Mary, Jesus' mother, Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, the sister of Martha, they all saw Jesus being wrapped up, being given the basic Jewish burial ritual by Joseph of Arimathea and being placed in that fresh tomb. And throughout all of this, you remember, as we read the story during Holy Week, the disciples all run away because they were afraid. They were traumatized. They were scared. They didn't know what was going to happen to them. They were not sure whether because Jesus has been arrested, they were also going to be arrested. They were not sure whether because Jesus has been crucified, they were also going to be facing some kind of consequence. So they were afraid. And they were always making sure that when they were together, the doors were locked. And Jesus appears to them. And so he says, peace be with you. Jesus was trying to address their emotional state, their psychological state. Peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Don't be anxious. Don't be in angst. Don't be scared, friends. Peace be with you, he tells them. And then he assures them that it is indeed Jesus not, not a ghost, as some of the other Gospels uh, relate the story. They thought he was a ghost. This is, he wanted to make sure that they understood that he is indeed risen. That it is Jesus. That he is the one in front of them. Of course, we realize that the fact that the doors were locked, the windows probably also closed and so on, did not impede Jesus' access to them in the room. The resurrected Lord has a body, a new body, a changed body that is not subject to time, matter, and space, as it were. So Jesus stands in their midst, not impeded, not obstructed, not prevented, by walls and locked doors, and he gives them peace. And then he shows them his scars from the crucifixion, the scars in his hands on his side. Do you have scars? We all have either emotional or physical scars. We have psychological scars. Jesus understand our scars. Just as he has scars from his experiences, he knows we have scars from ours. I have a scar. Uh, those who know me may not even notice it, but I have a scar on my, on my arm. If you look well, you probably see a darkened part of my arm right there. It's kind of from here to here. I think I was about six or seven years old when I got this car. It was a car from being burned by steam. There was a cooking pot going on on the fire, and I was curious to find out what was cooking because it really smelled good. Of 
because I had been told not to go near the fire. I had been told not to touch the pot, but my curiosity was stronger than the fear that I had been, you know, told to have, the healthy fear for hot things. And so I opened the pot and the steam gushed out and got my my arm, of course, it's, it's been healed, but the scar is still there. How many, you know, almost 50 years or so after the fact, I still have that scar. We all have scars. Some of these scars are more uh, traumatic than what I am describing. And they are psychological and emotional. And Jesus showing his scar to the disciples is an acknowledgement that yes, this is a consequences of the experiences that I just went through. We have consequences of our experiences, our life stories as well, and Jesus respects that. Our scars are immersed in His redeeming and healing scars. Let me say that again. Our emotional and physical scars are immersed in Jesus's healing and redeeming scars. He was beaten and he was abused and he had scars and our scars are redeemed as a result. You know, one of the church fathers says, what is not assumed by Jesus is not healed. And Jesus has scars, and so our scars are healed in His. Let's continue in verse 21. Verse 21, Jesus says to them again, Peace be with you. And then He says what is next after Easter. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, my focus is what Jesus says is next here. He says, As my Father, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. That's what's next. As a result of the resurrection, as a result of our being risen with him, he says, I am sending you as the Father sent me. You are sharing in my sending. I am inviting you into my sending. Sending for what? Sending to do what? Jesus is basically saying, I am asking you, to go, to join me in my Father's sending, in sharing the good news of victory over sin and death on behalf of all humanity. And we do this sending work, so to speak, with the assurance of the peace that He gives, with the assurance that He is with us, He is in charge of it, He is the one who guides and leads and controls and he does so friend through his spirit through the holy spirit the holy spirit through the message of the gospel provides a dividing line friend between those who accept and those who do not accept the good news of god's love for all that's what the forgiveness part of that verse is about when he says you whoever you forgive it is within the context of the Spirit's work in the disciples. It's the context of the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is actually the dividing line, if you please. The Better put, the clarifying line between uh, of the message. The clarifying line through the message of the gospel and of those who accept or do not accept that invitation. It's the Holy Spirit that determines that. It's the Holy Spirit that makes who we are 
visible and possible, whether it's through the fruit of it, whether it's through the gifts of it, and so on. The Holy Spirit is what makes, what affirms our identity in Jesus Christ. Paul explains that many times in his Gospels. And that's what Jesus basically is saying here. God's love is for all, and the Holy Spirit in us, as we relate with each other, provides that message and clarifying who we are in Christ Jesus. Verse 24. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, those are two names that both mean twain. One of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, that is Thomas, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. So Thomas was not ready to accept the fact that Jesus is risen. He's not. He is one who believes in facts, so to speak, and he accepts facts that he himself has evaluated, which is not bad in itself. In fact, we need that so that we do not, as Scripture also tells us, be swayed to and fro like, uh, like waves back and forth with every wind of belief or teaching. So he says, look, I won't believe until I actually see him because I, for Thomas, it's impossible for such a resurrection to occur. Even after Lazarus, Thomas was having a difficulty believing in the resurrected Christ. Verse 26, a week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them this time. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Now, Jesus is very sensitive to the emotional and psychological state of his disciples. They've been through a lot as a result of his, uh, the association with him. And he's providing comfort. He's providing them the assurance, the understanding that they have peace in him. They can't have it anywhere else. It is continued association with Jesus that provides the peace that they need. Then verse 27, he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Verse 28, Thomas said to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus says to him, verse 29, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which, were not, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written, John says, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. This is a beautiful narration of the what next that Jesus gives to his disciples. I know, like Thomas, we all have our times of doubt. And that's fine. That's all right. That's one of the ways that we are human. That's some of the ways that our humanity manifests itself. And so we have times of doubt in this life of tension. But hopefully we have these doubts in Christ. What do I mean by that? We take our doubts to him. Just as Thomas did. I want to see him. I want to touch him. I want to feel him. I want to know for sure that he's indeed alive. And he did say, my Lord and my God, when he saw Jesus. We are blessed to believe that Jesus is risen. The unseen Lord is alive with an unseen eyes of the spirit-led heart. That's what we are. We don't have the opportunity of physically handling Jesus' arm or palms and side. But we see the risen Lord 
with an unseen eyes of the Spirit-led heart. We see the risen Lord in our own hearts, in our own life experiences. Yeah, That's what Jesus is pronouncing blessing on. That even though, unlike Thomas, we do not have that opportunity, we still believe. And we believe because the Spirit enables our hearts and our minds to grasp the truth of what's happened by faith. And that is what verses 30 to 31 is saying. We believe the written word that points us to the living word who gives life and who is risen with us. So belief is the acceptance and work we are called to as a response to the incredible love of God and to the resurrected life of Jesus in us. In John chapter 17, let's pick up from this go that Jesus instructs us. He says, as the Father sent me, I am sending you which implies, go, go out there. And in chapter 17, the same gospel according to John, Jesus talks about this before his crucifixion. In John chapter 17, verses 15 to 20, again, this is telling us what next after the resurrection, after Easter, what next? Well, this is what next. In verse 20, the 17th chapter of John. Jesus is praying to the Father and he's praying to the Father about you and me. Verse 15, he says, my prayer is not that you take them, that is his disciples, out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. So that means that we do not have our motivation from the world. We don't have our frame of reference from, from, reference from the world. We are identified in Jesus, not the world. The ideologies of the world is not what leads us, but the living word, the Son of God. So we are not of the world. We are not of the systems and the culture of this world in the sense of it being the motivating and reference point the world view for our lives. Verse 17, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So it's, it's our it's being consecrated or dedicated within the context of truth. And Jesus is the truth and his church is supposed to be the pillar of that truth. It is in that that we are apart from the world. Right? So to sanctify is to set apart, to consecrate, to dedicate for a purpose, an intentional focus. Verse 18, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. That's exactly what he was saying in John 20 after his resurrection to the disciples. As the Father sent me, I am now what? Sending you. And he's saying here in verse 18, As you, Father, sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly san sanctified. Verse 20, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So we are being sent out, friend. You are being sent out with a message. And what is that message? Message is what is referred to as the gospel. And what is that gospel? The gospel basically means good news. And what is the good news? Well, the good news is that God loves you. And God has sent his son in a sacrificial way to show that love. And that through the work of his son, you have life. And you are risen with him. And your sins are forgiven and mine are. And not only are our sins forgiven, we're no longer condemned. 
But not only are we no longer condemned, but we have the amazing blessing of a love relationship, of a joy relationship with God, of a peace relationship with Him for all eternity. So we are free. We are free from death. We are free from sin. We are free from the law. But we are also free for relationship with God, of love, of joy, of peace, of forgiveness. And we are free for relationship with God in Christ, by His Spirit, and with each other as well for all eternity. That's the good news. There's nothing that you can do to earn that. There's nothing that I can do to earn that. That's the good news. Sometimes it feels so good, so good that we want to do something for it. The only thing we do, friend, is to believe. And to believe is to accept your immersion into the person and work of Jesus. And the person and work of Jesus is about a life of love, of sharing, of caring, of helping, of growing others. A sacrificial life that is modulated and moderated by the Holy Spirit. That's the good news. And Jesus is sending you and me, inviting you and me to be part of this movement that shares this gospel, this good news, this truth, this reality of God's love for you. This good news that says no matter how bad you think you've been, no matter how unworthy you feel, that God places His love on you and He raises you up with Jesus. No matter how many times you fall, you are raised up with Jesus. No matter how many times addiction brings you down, you are raised up with Jesus. No matter how many times you miss the mark, you are made straight with Jesus. That's the good news. Sin does not have dominion over you anymore. Death does not have dominion over you anymore. The law does not have dominion over you anymore. Jesus is the one who has dominion and he says, you are free and you are free in me. The only true freedom that exists in all the universe is a freed life as a slave in Jesus Christ. That's the good news. And it doesn't cost you a thing. And Jesus says, what is next? Well, join me in sharing this with your family, with your loved ones, with your friends, with your neighbors, with your co-workers, with your fellow students, with your peers. So we join Jesus in his sent mission from the Father. He calls us to go. God is sending, God is a sending God. He sends Jesus and Jesus sends us. We are consecrated or dedicated, redeemed, set apart as relationally holy, as relationally ready, as relationally accepted, as relationally invited into a new creation in Jesus and sent out to share this, this beautiful and inclusive truth this gospel, this good news of God's relational, sacrificial love for humanity. That's what we are sent to share. And we share it within the context of our own experience of it. That's what it means to be a witness for Jesus. You're a witness of your own experience of your life being immersed in His and His life in you. Do you feel sent? That's what we have next, friend. So God wants us to have a timeless love relationship with Him through Jesus and through the power of His Spirit. In Jesus, everything has been made new. Everything has been made possible. That's the good news. Let's see how Jesus puts it again in Matthew 28. Remember, this is after the resurrection. When we read the commission, the great commission, sometimes we forget that it is being given after the resurrection. So, basically what it is saying is that with the reality and truth of the risen Lord and our being raised with Him comes this privilege 
comes this commission, comes this sending, comes this command, go. So let's start from Matthew 28 and let's start from verse 16. We are in Matthew 28 and in verse 16. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, that is Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And so in verse 18, Jesus comes to them and says this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, as a result of this understanding that I am the authoritative one, I am the King of kings and the Lord of lords, I am the one whose name is above all other names, I am the one by whose name every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that I am indeed Lord. On the basis of this understanding, that I am the sovereign great I am who is in charge. Go, he says. And that's the title of the message today. Go. The Greek can be better understood as, as you are going, as you are living life. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, as some translations would say, into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's what's next, friend. What's next is that we've been recruited, so to speak, invited, included in this sending that Jesus gives. And he says to go and make disciples. We'll talk about that next time. What does that mean to make disciples? But that's what is next. In Matthew 28 verses 18 to 20 specifically. But we started reading from verse 16. This is church in action, friend. This is Christian in action. We don't want to see church as happening only a day a week for about two hours on Sunday. That's not what Jesus intended his church to be about. Jesus calls us to come and then to go, to go to our family, to go to our friends, to go to our colleagues, to our neighbors, to our peers with the good news of God's redeeming and sacrificial love, joyous love for all of us. Being and doing church is joining Jesus in relationships of sacrificial and joyous love with others throughout the week. So church is not just meant for you know, a group of people to assemble for about two hours or so interacting, being lectured to, and then going home and then coming back next Sunday for the same. Church is meant to be a dynamic relational engagement of one another, motivating, inspiring, encouraging, and of others sharing the good news of Jesus in a one-on-one -on -one relationship, in group relationships, in sharing and showing life-on-life -life love the love of Jesus through the power of His Spirit with others. That is what making disciples is about. And as I said, we'll talk some more about it next Sunday. It is the commitment to share and to grow in the knowledge of our new creation in Jesus. To grow in Him and in His grace. So friend, God loves you. That's the truth of Easter. That's the truth of the resurrection. His Son is the risen Lord who raises you up. No matter how dire your situation or circumstances may be, that you may think it is. He, God, raises you up and restores you to who He intended for you to be in this life, in His Son. And not only in this life, but also in the life to come. And Jesus sends you after you come to that understanding 
He sends you to go and share this same truth, this good news, with others. Are you willing to join Him and to go? I pray you do. There is no greater gift, no greater joy, no greater sense of fulfillment in living out our purpose that God has for us, the plan that God has for us. Tell Him you are surrendered to Him. All of you, the good, the bad, the ugly, the weird, all of you surrendered to Him. And to use you in His kingdom work as it pleases Him. Reach out for help. God did not intend for you and for me to do this life alone. But I look forward to seeing you next time as we go with Jesus, as He sent out ones, sharing the good news of God's love for all, an invitation to all, to be part, to accept the risen life in Jesus together. As we seek to know Jesus and to make him known through worship, through family fellowship, through community and neighborhood engagements with the good news. As we do so in relationships of love, of faith, and of hope. Amen. Now let's join our praise team for a song. And hopefully, by God's grace, I will see you next time. God bless. You've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. If you've been hearing the same old voice and the same old lies.
I want to invite you to a Zoom discussion after this message. The ID is on the screen. Uh, if you need to, to call using the phone, the phone number is on your screen as well. If you are watching on Facebook, the link that you can click on to join Zoom is in the description. If you are watching from our website, the link is on top of the video. I look forward to, to meeting you uh, on Zoom for discussion and for fellowship. God bless.